All right, Brendan. Brendan, oh, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Uh, Kansas. What part? Olathe. It's about 20 minutes south of Kansas City. Kansas, on the Kansas side, not Missouri. Yeah. Tell me about your family. Um, so, I, I, uh, you know, my mom and dad got married, and then uh, my mom already had my brother, but he's 361 days older than me. And um, then they had me in May, um, about, you know, she's, uh, you know, 20 months younger than me. So we're all real close, you know, in between. Um, but uh, when we were one, two, and three, something happened. I don't, I don't ask questions really. I, I tried a few times, but uh, my mom ended up leaving my dad just at, in the night because they argued all the time, I guess, and uh, left, left him. And uh, so he was a struggling single father for a, a few years. And she finally, I initially remember her coming back into my life around six years old and with the new stepdad and all that was crazy to me. Um, so I had to adapt to two new siblings, um, but I was very loyal to my dad because that's all I knew was my dad. So, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I grew up, you know, just basically being devoted to my father. Uh, so the majority of your childhood was with your dad or with your mom? Oh, my, my dad. Yeah. So you, when your mom came back at six years old, she it was it was the uh, every other weekend or every two year oh, two weekends. Yeah. And then every other um, summer type thing. Every, and then uh, we'd switch with Thanksgivings, um, everything like that. My brother, when he was 12, he ended up moving with my uh, mom. And that kind of broke my dad's heart, broke my heart because that was my brother. And we're Irish twins because we're on, only 361 days apart. Um, and then even at uh, 16, my sister ended up moving with my mom because she didn't like the uh, discipline because my dad was older, uh, 11 years older than my mom. Um, uh, and, and he's an old country boy from Kansas. So, you know, they believe in spankings and in and, and discipline and, you know, don't talk back and everything like that. And my mom grew up an orphan. So she never believed in, and she's a twin, she never believed in... Um, spanking and everything like that so um it was it was rough on on both of us to lose both my siblings um but by that time i i resented my mom until i was 12 years old because i was just so loyal to my dad because that's all i knew and it was just then at you know six, 15 years old it, it's just me and him now and then i'd go see my mom if i could you know every other weekend or every couple weeks and then my brother and sister would come down and visit if they could, but at that time we were becoming teenagers, so you know we might have stuff to do. What was your life like with your dad? Uh, it was, you know, it was it was rough after it was just me and him. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, I had to drop out of school at 16 because um, some issues happened, and he got on the uh, sex offender list. Uh, unfortunately, um, so. I ended up, he couldn't get a job and he hurt his back and he had a steel plate in his arm um, when I was about 10 years old. So it was already hard for him to get a job, even at like a convenience store. So when that happened, nobody's going to hire you in Kansas, you know, because they, there's just not that many opportunities and let alone the experience that he has was mostly construction. Um, so I had to drop out of school at 16 and start paying all the bills. You know, I was paying an equivalent to Kansas. It was seven hundred dollars a month, which is a lot, you know, um, back then. So it was it was very stressful at at that point. But um, you know, I tried. I, but I still love my dad. I I never regretted anything. I never, um, you know, was ashamed of of him. I supported him and everything, um, and never never judged him. So at sixteen, you became the breadwinner. I, yeah, sixteen. I I dropped out of school. And uh, I was making two thirteen an hour at IHOP plus tips, but you know, guys don't make as much tips, you know, as as women um, most of the time. So I really we, we were we we're staying in a hotel, a Roach Motel that's you know, 150, 200 square feet, um, paying eight hundred dollars a month, and it was it was nasty. But we did that for a year um, until I was able to uh, get my GED. 
uh, on the day I turned 17. And we moved over across the street to get a studio apartment, which was a little bit bigger. But he slept in the kitchen on a cot, and I slept in the front room on a futon. And uh, I just, you know, I, it was only four fifty a month, so we were cutting bills in half. Um, but we didn't have food stamps, nothing like that. We were waiting on his disability. That way he could bring in some income because, like I said, he, he was already disabled. He had a heart, heart disease, um, congestive heart failure. He already had four heart attacks by that time. And he had a open heart, double bypass open heart, which uh, he had nine stents put in, which was a hospital record. And uh, they, he was a hard smoker. So the doctor told him, you got to stop smoking. And what he heard was, stop smoking cigarettes, but I can switch to cigars. Um, and his family, my, his brother and sister, you know, that helped raise us. My aunt was our, our daycare provider when we were children because she wouldn't charge him when he could work but uh they were no that's that's not what it means it, it means stop smoking or you're going to kill yourself because you know that's what smoking does so so your father lived how long uh he lived to 59 years old um so uh, he passed away when i was 25. um uh i i was working uh my sister at at that time when i was um about, she had a baby at 16 that passed away at stillbirth, and then she had um, my other nephew at 18, and he had to have a heart transplant um, when he was eight months old, and, and that was stressful too. And we, because my mom had gotten remarried, um, you know, she, my stepdad didn't want to have, you know, a brand new baby in the house because he's kind of, you know, he's he's stern and he's like, you know, hey, I pay the bills around here. I'm not going to support two extra mouths, you know, uh, not to be mean, but he's just, you know, that's just how it is. You know, at that time, you know, we we're she was only 18. So, you know, they were only together a few years. And, um, so, he, you know, it's like it's not my kids, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm that's my wife's kids, you know, but. So that was that was difficult, you know, uh, really difficult. Um, so she ended up moving in with me and my dad in a small two bedroom apartment and I was sleeping on the couch and my dad was sleeping in a tiny room and I let her have the uh, bigger room, my, my, my room that I did have uh, so she could have it with the baby. Uh, and then she ended up having another one. So then we had two and she has anger issues and she's bipolar and my dad has anger issues and they would argue all the time and she got like married but he beat her half to death so that's why and he went to prison and that's why she moved with us um but it was just it was killing my dad stress-wise you know um and i was just too busy working to mediate anything because i was the breadwinner because my sister was taking care of the kids during the day my dad at that point was getting disability but it was, wasn't that much. So that's what we did for, you know, up until uh, uh, I was able to get, um, save up enough money to get a house finally that had three levels and it was going to be perfect. My sister or, uh, and two nephews would be on the bottom of the basement with the bathroom and everything finished. Me in the middle. And we actually had a kitchen, a big kitchen, and my dad always wanted a big kitchen. And then we had an upstairs, an attic that was big enough for my dad. So it was perfect. Uh, and it was only $800 a month. We had to switch to Missouri, uh, which is fine. But uh, three days later, uh, I watched him die on a ventilator um, from uh, heart issues. Sir. So after your dad dies, then what do you do? Well, I, I, I break down and I, I start drinking really, really hard. I was already drinking for like a year and a half after I dropped out of church. Because, um, you know, you were in, I never touched a drop until I was 25. But I just started drinking really heavily, showing up to work drunk, but passing, passing off with it because I could, was a night auditor at the time for a hotel. So I was the only one working. So, you know, I'd have a few shots before I went in or, or four or five shots just to get tipsy to go in. And I went to the hospital uh, a few days afterwards 
Uh, my dad died before I went into work. That was the first time I've ever been late to work um, because I thought I was having a heart attack because I was breaking down so much, you know. And I figured heart disease runs in the family. I, I, I got it too, probably. And I was overweight. I was 270 pounds. Um, so I was scared. And that's the only time I was ever late. And I was crying. And actually, my dad died on my stepdad's birthday, which I, I called him crying. I said, I'm sorry, you know, happy birthday, you know. Um, he's like, man, I understand, you know. But our whole family got to be around him. Um, but about a month later, we told the landlord, please let us you know, get out of the lease, you know, of the situation. The whole reason we got here was for my dad to have, be not stressed out because he was waiting on a heart transplant himself. Um, and he, he had stopped smoking, but they said he had to stop smoking for six months. But when they went in to do a surgery to test his heart, um, they intubated him. Uh, and before he died, he said, you know, please forgive me for everything. And I was like, dad, you know, because it was just me and him for a long time. And we were, you know, and he told all three of his kids, you know, please forgive me. And I'm like, Dad, you know, it's okay. Um, but they, the landlord ended up, a few months later, ended up letting us get out of the lease. And we moved to our, our mom's house in Missouri. Uh, and then uh, uh, I got a call from, uh, uh, you know, Delta Airlines that uh, I got approved for a uh, flight attendant position that I'd been interviewing for for months and I was ecstatic because that's a dream job of mine because at that point I'd already been to uh, 18 countries and about 38 states uh, because I worked hard and I that's why I had so many jobs because I would quit but I would save up money and I was a gambler too so I would win jackpots and save up money so how many jobs did you have I had 65 jobs by the time I was 18 years old because I I got bored. I would, one, I would, one day at Little Caesars, that's all that lasted, and I got fired two days at a, a, another place because I was like, this ain't for me, you know, and I, I believe, like, you know, they say, you know, do what you love, and I figured, you know, I don't have a college degree. I, I barely got a high school diploma. I don't have any experience, really, because, you know, I can't build a resume, so I have to lie. I bought my first car, you know, by figuring out the numbers of what taxes would be. <laughs> I lied about that. And I was kind of proud of myself. Um, so I, I tricked the bank and the uh, dealership into giving me my first car that way. Um, Cause I, I'm, I am smart, you know, I am, I'm street smart and school smart, but I did the math and everything, but. So you worked as a, as a flight attendant for how I worked long? as a flight attendant for two and a half years. I worked in the top 5% of many hour, how many hours you work because there's, there's, you know, certain, um, you know, regulations, FAA regulations, but I was working, you know, six days a week, you know, sometimes you work 15, 16 hours a day and you're only getting paid for four of them because you only get paid from when the doors are closed and you push back from the gate. When we have a six hour layover, like in the, the airport waiting, we don't get paid for that. So I don't know the rules now because it's been a couple of years, but I did that for two and a half years and, and uh, um, the day before my interview, I watched my dad's brother, um, who's like 15 years older than him, uh, die. Same way, intubated, in a coma. Uh, he, he just went in just for a little thing. The doctor said everything's going to be fine. Nothing ever happens. You got small veins, but you know I'm I'm one of the best there is. And so we were like, you know, but I, for some reason, I called him a few days earlier and I said, I want to be there. And he's like, you don't have to be there. I want to be there. So I got to tell him goodbye. So that helped. And the next day I went to interview, took me six hours interview because um, they hire less than 2% of applicants. So uh, I got, I got it and I was ecstatic because I felt accomplished for once that I finally get to follow my dreams because I never traveled as much before. And I wanted to do it before, but I didn't want to leave my dad on his own because I worried about my dad, you know, all the time about him being lonely because he, he never had a, a girlfriend or anything my whole life. He was and, and I mean, because at one point you got to disclose, you know, your background of, of having that offense. And that's just too humiliating for him. And, you know, I understand that. Uh, but um, so I did that for two and a half years. But the, after the first year, um, 
my uh, five-year-old nephew that had the heart transplant on January 1st died. And I was on the plane and we were boarding and, you know, it was, it was just, I broke down in the bathroom for about 15 minutes and I said, what can I do? And then I uh, picked myself up, finished boarding, finished the flight, finished my whole trip. And then uh, I asked them, that's the first time I ever asked time off. I was ever late. I was never late, but I, the first time I asked off in my whole life, I've never had vacation. So I took time off. I went and paid for my son's uh, nephew's funeral. Uh, and I was sicker than a dog. And that's around when COVID started. So I may have had one of the first cases of COVID. I don't know. But so that didn't help. Um, but I, I just started drinking even more. Because on the planes, you, I just would steal the little bottles. I'd steal eight to ten of them a night. And I built up such a tolerance that I'd have to drink more and more. And if you have a 24-hour layover in Costa Rica, and I was making a lot of money, most money anybody made. So I could, didn't have to steal, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm used to being poor in my life up, up until that point. So I'm like, you know, you might as well take what's free. Um, but, you know, I would buy a fifth and drink it in, in five hours. Um, but when I got fired, just... I had to move to my mom's and the, for the first time I wasn't able to take care of anybody and, and it really just, because I was gambling while I was drinking, I gambled through over $100,000 a year um, and that was ruining my life because I was in debt, maxed out like what three credit cards. Slots, I, I did slots, um, but I was good at it, I did high limit. I would do anywhere from you know $12 to $125 a, a win and when I left, uh, I was based in Boston and then Detroit. When I left Detroit, I left with $43,000 uh, and, and eight hours. Uh, and that was gone in uh, three weeks because of all my gambling. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I moved with my mom and I just felt humiliated. And then all I did, because I had a little bit of savings, was just drink. And my stepdad hated it because I, it depended on how I was. Just, I was just sitting there with my mom all day because she can't work. She, she became disabled, and uh, so I was just enjoying time with my mom, so that's one good thing. My sister ended up getting a place with a friend of hers, um, and she ended up having a little girl. Um, so um, at that point, uh, I was just drinking all day, and by the time my stepdad got home, he's drunk again, you know, telling my mom, and, and she's like, I, I know, he, and he, they would get in arguments, and I'd feel bad about it, but then if I'm in an aggressive state, I'd get in an argument with him, and I'm like, don't blame my mom for this, you know, it's not her fault, but eventually, my sister got her own place in Kansas, and that, that's when they were in Missouri, and my stepdad told my mom, he's, he's got to go, if he's not going to stop drinking, and he's not going to get a job, because I tried to get a job, but I showed up drunk, like drunk and I got an argument with the manager and uh, so you know I, I quit I walked out um, and I was drinking and driving and luckily I, I I never got pulled over for it or never wrecked or nothing so I'm grateful for that and I know I don't condone it but um, so my mom's like you know he's he's the breadwinner I, you know, I don't make no money so I mean now my sister's got a place you know and my sister's like okay but if you come here you can't drink I said, all right, you know, okay, I, I'll get a job or I'll help, I'll help watch the kids because the daycare is super expensive for a single mom in Kansas when minimum wage is still seven twenty-five, and she was only making 11 bucks an hour trying to pay $700 in rent. Um, so I said, all right. So I started helping out with the kids, watching the kids at my sister's house, living with her. Um, but then I, I uh, just kept drinking. And if I couldn't afford it, I'd go steal it. And if I got caught, I would just run uh, because I didn't have no money. I didn't have no job. So I would have to borrow money from my mom and, that, and then my stepdad would, and my sister would get stop enabling him. And then sometimes I'd steal from my sister. Like, you know, if she had like her uh, debit card out or something, I'd say I'd go to the store and buy something. And because I knew she didn't have the checking app because she you know, didn't keep track of her. She's bad with money. So she won't notice, you know, like a, a $5 bottle, you know, and that'll get me eight shots. And she'll see me over there drinking like this, you know, and she, are you drinking again? I was like, 
what? No. And then she was like, don't lie to me. And so we, we got in arguments a lot and it became really toxic. Uh, and, and eventually uh, I got caught stealing and I got pulled over. And, and I'd been drinking all day, so luckily they didn't get me for drunk driving, but they got me for lying to them because I told them a wrong name because I didn't want to go to jail. I thought I was going to go to jail. And uh, I, I got my first uh, booking. So I didn't go to jail, but they gave me a ticket. I went to court. They said, just, you know, we're not even going to charge you for the theft. Just we're going to charge you for lying to the police. Um, my sister's like, look, dude, you're ruining your life. You're hurting yourself. And, and at that time, I'd already been to the hospital twice for bad withdrawals when I did try to stop because I would stop cold turkey. And, they, and I guess they say, and I tried to lie to them saying, guys, I can't stop cold turkey. You know, the doctor says I'm not supposed to. And, oh, that's that's bull. You know, they're, they're, you're lying to us. I'm like, no, I promise, Google it. But I just go steal more during the day because my sister was working. And sometimes... Um, if, if she had daycare for my niece, my nephew was at school because he was five at the time. If I had to watch my niece, I'm in there stuffing drinks in the car seat. I'm not proud of it, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because it's so stupid of how desperate I was. But I, I became so addicted. And, and after I called the cops on myself twice, and I did get booked in the drunk tank, I woke up naked in a suicide vest. Um, that was kind of a, like, dude, if you don't stop drinking, then I, I got to kick, I'm sorry, you got to go. And this is around January in Kansas. So it's 25 degrees outside. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I want to get better. I do. And they're like, no, you don't. Cause you keep drinking and prove it. It's just really hard with addiction. Um, what do you think people don't understand about that situation? the strength of it you know the when you're so desperate that's your only relief uh you know i don't want to be a pill popper you know i don't want to go to the doctor and get on a bunch of anxiety and depression medicines because i was depressed because of my situation because of my nephew and my uncle and my dad all within you know 15 months dying and i've never my grandma died in 97 when i was four years old so that that's the first Time, my dad was the first funeral I went to so I wasn't used to it the loss have you ever been in love uh, uh, well that's a that's a when I was uh, 20 years old I met a girl online from church on Facebook and uh, we ended up talking and she was from Guatemala and um, we skyped every day for six months and they're like oh she's one of those you know uh, ones that are faking their ID and I said no no guys I, I'm looking at her you know and so I said well I'm gonna buy a ticket I'm gonna come down there and I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose to you and so uh, I uh, I at 20 years old I went down to Guatemala my first international flight and uh, well my my first flight ever actually my first international flight and I went down there six days later I proposed four days later I flew back to Kansas uh, so I was deep in love and the way i knew i was in love in my head because i had girlfriends but i never thought about cheating on her because you know i would and i wouldn't look at other girls and lust after them or anything i'm like no i'm grateful for what i got and i was in church at the time so i had a in a very strong church so kind of you know very strong beliefs and you're not supposed to have sex before marriage you know women have to wear skirts men have to wear pants you know you, you can't live together until you're married. And so I'm like, you know, feeling guilty about, you know, talking to her and, and then we're wanting to do stuff. And I want to get married because I was getting told that I was going to die soon, basically, because of the rapture. So I was like, I want to hurry up and get married. So I wanted to speed this thing up. But I had to I, sit in a room with her mom in front of her and her two brothers. And they translated and I had to ask permission in front of my fiance because she said yes, and I thought, this is so, I was like, this is a red flag, I should, I should have known, but long story short, you know, uh, I go, she comes with her mom, because her mom wouldn't let her come by herself, even though she was five years older than me, 25, um, to Kansas, and then I went back for about 20 days in November, and uh, I had to break things off just because she couldn't become independent, so that's about the only time I've ever been in love when I was 20. Other than that, you know, I, I really just was 
started just getting addicted to money. And then I started gambling, you know. And I was like, you know, hey, I like making money. I'm just going to make money. Plus, I have to provide for my family. So the drinking unrivaled at all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I mean, the drinking was it's it's a depressant, you know, but for me, it was a high. And, you know, it became to the point when I'd get addicted to it. If I didn't drink it like now, you know, uh, I, I can't sleep. I haven't slept for four days, you know, because I, I'm trying to get off again. And that's why I look so tired, I think. And uh, so what brought you out to L.A.? My sister kicked me out. Well, because that last altercation, we got in a fight, an argument, because I was drunk by noon. And I lived upstairs, and she was like, dude, I, you know, I come home and you're drunk, like, like this drunk already. I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm fine. You know, I'm just watching TV. She was like, do you need to get out, dude? And I'm like, where am I going to go? It's 25 degrees. She said, I don't care. You got to find somewhere. And we got in a fight, she locked the door, and I was banging on the door trying to break it down. I ended up, you know, screaming, yelling, and I ended up punching her window in, and I have a scar. And uh, the cops came and they arrested me. And uh, the next day, they said, you're not allowed to go back to your, your sister's house. And I said, okay. But the next day, when I got out, I went straight to my sister's house, and I'm like, you know, because she would always, her and my mom would always, we'd get into arguments, but at the end of the day, they would, they would, dude, we need to do something about this. And so we talked to my stepdad because she didn't have no money. My mom didn't have no money. I didn't have no money. My stepdad was the only one with money. So we, I said, because I was based here in uh, Inglewood for a year as a flight attendant, so I knew the weather. And it's February. So I'm like, you know what? I know that area. If you'll just buy me like a plane ticket or a train ticket out to L.A., I'll pack my bags and I'll just go out there and, and wing it. So that's what we did, because I'd rather be in 60 degree weather than 20 degree weather. And you're homeless now on Skid Row? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Homeless. And uh, I wasn't I, I was homeless for two weeks and then I tried to shelter for two months, but I got kicked out because I, I got back on the bender and I would I, in the last. How much are you drinking now? 15 shots a day if I can if I can if I can buy it it's 15 shots a day if I can steal it then it's it's usually about you know seven uh seltzers and that's but I have such a high tolerance that it, it doesn't really get me it doesn't get me super drunk it just gets me tipsy but the 15 shots will get me drunk enough to put me to sleep um, but it's a coping mechanism because it's so stressful out here because I've never seen I've, we don't have homeless people in Kansas you know it's so sparse and everything and and yeah, the winters suck, but, you know, usually you have some, maybe one or two shelters out there. I come here and I've, I've never seen tents like this. I mean, the only way, place I can compare to is uh, Vegas. I saw Tent City in Vegas, and I thought that was crazy. Um, but I come out here and uh, they gave me money to buy a tent, so I bought a small little tent. Because I was like, I'm not going to go to a shelter. I'm just going to, you know get my stuff together and and make some get a job make some money and get a big tent and just make my own little apartment but that hasn't happened no because i was like getting tired of the sirens every night and the loud booms and the and the people smoking yelling and arguing at two three four o'clock in the morning so it stressing me out so i was like man if i'm gonna change maybe i should look into a shelter so i went to a shelter and that only lasted two uh two months because I fell off the wagon and they kicked me out. And my buddy got kicked out the week before me. And so I saw him and I was like, hey, you know, we might as well try to at least be together so it's safer because it's people are, you see dead bodies or you see people, you hear gunshots. It's dangerous here. It is. So we, we lasted three months, one block away from here. And we ended up getting robbed at gunpoint and getting told, and they shot it off so we knew it was real. And I've never dealt with guns, you know, I've heard gunshots, but I've never dealt with guns. But to have one in my face, it, it, it you know, it'll change you. Uh, so we were like, okay, you know, we'll leave. So I ended up going to Santa Monica that night and pulling a fake gun out on a security guard, a BB gun. And so now I have to go to court here in a few weeks for that. And so now I got a warrant, warrant out in Kansas because I wasn't able to show up to court. And I already missed my court date last week. So... 
you know, I'm just, I'm, people all the time talk down to me here because I am a minority and, and uh, in Skid Row and just, I have no say. And I have a mouth on me because I come from Kansas. I'm an old school boy too. So I'm used to respect. And when I don't say nothing to you and you disrespect me from the get go, like, hey, you can't sit there. And I'm like, dude, I'm just waiting for lunch. I'm in line. Like, nah, ma, get out of here. I talk back. And people have warned me, dude, you're going to get killed out here with that mouth. And I'm like, well, be it. you know, I just, I don't like that res disrespect. I didn't do nothing to him. But you can't have that mentality out here. Everybody's high. Everybody's high, dancing in the street. I like the happy ones, but the, the aggressive ones that are arguing and fighting all the time. And I've, I've gotten in a fist fight with a guy that when I was drunk and he was high, I don't even know why. I can't remember. It wasn't even at my tent, but... So now, you know, I, I'm trying to get out of Skid Row because I'm, or get back into a shelter because I really am, am, am trying to get my life together and, and get back on track because, I mean, it, it's killing me. I've been hospitalized, hospitalized four times since I've been out here because of severe withdrawals. Um, and I already have cirrhosis, pancreatitis, and fatty liver damage, the beginning stages, but they, they told me you're, gonna, you're not going to live to 35 if you keep on. How old are you now? 30. You're 30. And, and I already have a, a fear of death, you know, and, and, which is ironic. So, you know, I'm like, man, I, it's not worth it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to being, I was poor and then I went on a high and made something of myself. And I made more money than anybody else in my family. And then that just all came crashing down. And now I'm at the worst of anybody in my family. And that's just, it's so emotionally uh, draining, you know. So now I'm, I'm just, I'm desperate. I, I, like I said, the only money I have is the benefits that I've never had before. I get food stamps and I get 220 bucks a month other than, and I push the cans, which I always saw those people. And I was like, I, I, if I get to that point, I'm going to go back to Kansas if I can. But here I am pushing cans, you know, making $6 for six hours of work um, or, or trying to panhandle, but because, uh, you know, because I'm young, I guess they, and I'm not dirty, you know, because I, I try to still have a standard for myself. They just, nobody gives me money. Is there anything you've learned from all of this that you've been through? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do drugs. Don't get addicted to anything. Just and have a sober mind, you know, stay grateful for what you have, you know, love the people around you. Uh, just learn from your mistakes and grow from them. Don't turn back to them, you know, because it's a repeating cycle of, of what I'm doing. And if you don't stop, you're going to kill yourself. And it's not worth it. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I wish you all the luck in the world, Brandon. Thank, thank you. you.